questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel, and that's found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Forensic Genetic Genealogy, an Emerging Game Changer for Cold Case Resolution. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Verogen, who developed the content for this presentation. Verogen serves those who pursue the truth using genetic tools, powering by Illumina's gold standard sequencing technology and working in partnership with forensic laboratories. They are advancing next generation sequencing to help unlock the true potential of genetic identification. And now, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our first speaker is Andreas Tilmar, who works as a forensic geneticist at the National Board of Forensic Medicine in Sweden. And as a senior lecturer and associated professor of forensic genetics at Linköping University in Sweden. He is well experienced with working from working over 15 years in the field. He has signed more than 10,000 reports on DNA based paternity, paternity, sorry, paternity kinship and missing person investigations. His current task includes technical leadership mixed with R&D and is the main senior or co-author of more than 40 peer-reviewed articles. He is the chairman of the English-speaking working group ESWG of the International Society for Forensic Genetics, the ISFG. And now I'd like to introduce our second speaker. And she is Lori Napolitano, who is the Chief of Forensic Services for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, FDLE. She oversees FDLE's statewide genetic genealogy program. Eleven cases have been solved as a part of the program, and over a dozen more are in progress. She has been with FDLE for 30 years, working in both forensics and investigations, and also has four years of genetic genealogy experience. And now I'd like to introduce you to our third speaker, who is Sydney Holt. After earning her PhD from Baylor College of Medicine and before joining Illumina to lead their forensic genomics business, Sydney worked as a criminalist at the Santa Clara District Attorney Criminalistics Laboratory. She was a part of the original Applied Biosystems R&D team that developed the first kits and software for human identification using capillary electrophoresis and applied those products to caseworkers casework over 10 years as a DNA technical leader and forensic science division director for the city and county of San Francisco. Sydney currently serves as Verizon's CSO focused on advancing powerful genomic tools to improve public safety and global justice. Now, before I pass over the controls to our next, pre our first presenter, who is Andreas, and actually Andreas, I'll let you take control of the presentation and the mic. So let me release your audio here so that we can all hear you. There you go, Andreas, can you hear us? Okay, we can hear Andreas at this moment. So we're going to put Andreas on for hold and we're going to launch our first poll question while we try to fix Andreas's um, mic control. So at this time, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in this real-time poll question. Um, you can cast your votes on the question, which will appear on your screen momentarily. And there it is. 
Okay, we can hear Andreas at this moment, so we're going to put Andreas on for hold, and we're going to launch our first poll question while we try to fix Andreas's um, mic control. So, at this time, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in this real-time poll question. Um, you can cast your votes on the question, which will appear on your screen momentarily. And there, there you go, Andreas. Can you hear us? Okay, we can hear Andreas at this moment, so we're going to put Andreas on for hold, and we're going to launch our first poll question while we try to fix Andreas's um, mic control. So, at this time, I'd like to invite the audience to participate in this real-time poll question. Um, you can cast your votes on the question, which will appear on your screen momentarily. And there it is. And the question for you today is, how would you classify your level of knowledge regarding forensic genetic genealogy. I'll give you about 30 seconds to complete this poll question. And then I will be able to close the poll and share the results with you. And then from there we'll uh, join with Andreas. So another five seconds. It looks like we have about 80% of everyone has voted. So thank you very much. I really do appreciate your participation. And now I'm gonna close the polls and share the results with you. And here's the results of the poll. And the poll was, how would you classify your level of knowledge regarding forensic genetic genealogy? And we have 36% that said low, 56% said medium, and 8% that said high. Well, thank you very much for sharing or participating with us in that poll question. And now I'm going to pass over the mic and the controls to Andreas. So Andreas, when you're ready, you may begin. Great. Thanks. So, my name is Andreas Tilmar. I work in Sweden at the National Board of Forensic Medicine and at the Linköping University. And my intention here is to give sort of our experience and lessons learned from uh, starting to using, although still in a few cases, uh, genetic genealogy methods. And also from our experience from uh, working with this in R&D project. So first, of course, disclaimer, um, uh, the things that I will present here and, and discuss may not necessarily be the official position of, of the National Board of Forensic Medicine uh, or the Linköping University. Uh, however, I will sort of try to be, um, yeah, to introduce you for uh, the things that we have learned so far. So first, I would like to give some uh, basics uh, I guess everyone is familiar with what we're going to talk about, but, but just to introduce everyone. So when it comes to DNA and the use of DNA in legal applications, there are different uh, categories of uh, applications. Uh, the most common one, for, I guess, would be the where we try to match traces found at the crime scene uh, and, and try to match with suspects, but of course would be trying to establish the biological relationship between two or more individuals or to identify human remains from missing person uh, or um, um, disasters or, or, or similar. The thing here is in order to be successful with the matching, you do need a hypothesis or a suspect or alleged father, for example, to, to be able to do the matching. But in some cases we do not know uh, who or which sample to match against. We only have the sample from the sort of the crime scene uh, or from the, for example, human remains. And from this uh, DNA, we can still get some information. As you uh, are aware about, we can sort of est uh, and analyze the DNA to see this unknown individual's uh, eye color, hair color, skin color, from which part of the world he or she genetically originate from. But what's focused today is more or less uh, use the fact that we share DNA between or with our relatives. And if we can make use of that, which I've shown that we can, it's a much more informative uh, lead compared to the other one. So how can we use relative uh, to get information about this unknown donor? Yeah, the basic is, of course, that relatives share DNA. As you can see here in the left table, that close relatives do share a lot of DNA. 
but uh, even distant relatives like third cousins or fourth cousins share a reasonable amount of DNA that can be used if you have, uh, as we will see, large databases. Um, the other thing is that if you look at the table two here, that even though we perhaps might not have that many siblings or first cousins, but going to more distant relatives uh, or relationships like third cousins or fourth cousins, we do expect to have hundreds and, or up to thousands of those. And if the database that we are using is big enough, uh, we could expect to find at least one of these in the database. And obviously the basic is that uh, individuals that share a common ancestry, they also share DNA, since uh, a parent leave half of his or her um, or passing on half of his or her DNA uh, onto the children and by looking at the complete genome or at least the proportional genome we can, might find segments or um, variants that are shared identity by descent. So which relatives are expected to be found? Of course, this relies heavily on the size and the composition of the database that we're searching against. Uh, Erlich et al. They, uh, looked into this in a paper in Science, and they found that if approximately 1% of the population of interest is in such a database, there is more than 90% chance to find at least one-third cousin of any individual in that population. And of course, this is, uh, would um, be very efficient uh, if, as in this case, 1% of the population is in the database. So from a Swedish perspective, um, in Sweden we are around 10 million individuals, and it's not exactly known, but it's, um, it's believed that around 100,000 of Swedish individuals, current Swedish individuals, are in any of these um, larger uh, databases. So from that perspective, uh, we have a yeah, good a priori probability to find uh, distant relatives. And also, even though the largest proportion of the existing databases is n currently North Americans, uh, some of these have uh, Northern European ancestry. So even though they are those who are within the database are North Americans, their um, sort of ancestry and looking into, for example, third cousins might be a Northern European. So what's required here, of course, we do need DNA data from this unknown individual that we're trying to get some leads for. And we do need genome-wide data because we, if we're looking, for example, distant relatives like third cousins, we do not know which which part of the chromosome or which chromosome that they will share the DNA with some of their relatives. So therefore, we need sort of the genome-wide data. And of course, as I said before, we need a large reference database uh, in order to find at least some uh, distant relatives. And GEDmatch is, it is one of such a database that can be used. So now back to or into our experience from, from our lab. Uh, we have both experience from doing a research project that I will slightly touch. And also from a few, still a very few real cases. And it's only one of these real cases that I can present open or the data uh, and the information I can share uh, just for one case and I will do that. So first, a little bit of the research project. This is a paper that we published uh, last year. It's an open access paper where we sort of looked into the different um, ways to measure genetic relatedness and to do the sort of the classification uh, for the different relationship classes and looked into sort of the classification rates and the precisions and uh, if um, the classification was incorrect, was, was, which was the uh, answer, and so forth. And we compared, as I said before, different uh, approaches. The segment approach 
and I will not um, go into details about that, but that's the one that's mainly used nowadays by the larger databases, but we compared it to other uh, approaches that might be more um, um, relevant or more forensically uh, uh, used before. So uh, what about the case that we had done? This is one case that I can talk about. It's a missing person case. It's a murdered man that was murdered for approximately 15 years ago. And the police has no clues about who this murdered man could be. So even though STR profiles has been established and sent around through different databases, uh, no clues has, uh, or leads has been obtained yet. So uh, in 2018, the police turned to our lab with a question if we could help them uh, to extract DNA from the sample and to sort of do the DNA analysis in order for them to start searching one of these uh, genealogy DNA databases. So the question at the time, of course, we are a governmental authority, National Board of Forensic Medicine, and the question was if we can use these methods. Uh, as you know, there is legal issues, ethical issues, and also technical methodological issues. And a little bit of background about DNA investigations in Sweden. In Sweden, uh, our lab, National Board of Forensic Medicine, is, is headed under the Department of Justice. So we are not within the police authority, uh, but we do cases, uh, especially missing person identification cases uh, for the Swedish police authority. So the question at the time was, okay, can we do this? And of course, there are different aspects on this. The first one was, okay, the question is, is the analysis uh, or the scope within our current mission? And uh, what we came up at the time was that, okay, we can do the DNA typing uh, and sort of prepare and extract the relevant DNA information from the sample. But, uh, but we cannot do the actual database search because we felt at the time that we didn't have the authority to do such thing and to handle all the data from such a search. Uh, if you look at the legislation in Sweden, there's no explicit, explicit law against this. However, it's not totally clear from all aspects. So from a sort of sample to genotype, we can not see any problems. However, with the actual search, the police authority, they have sort of a, in a, um, a pilot at the moment where they investigate a few cases. And from that, they will sort of uh, and, and get a summary if this would be allowed in, in, in Sweden in the way it's have been used in these cases. So for this case that I'm talking about, uh, it was decided that we, okay, we can create and, or analyze and establish the DNA data required to do the search. However, the police authority need to take responsibility for the actual search in the database and the following genealogy, genealogy work. So briefly in this case, we use whole genome sequencing, uh, mainly because we do not have any good experience from microarrays when it comes to low quant DNA and also degraded uh, samples, which was the case in this uh, specific case. And also when we do whole genome sequencing, we sort of can create any SNP panel from the resulting data. So we do not need to establish which markers to be used from the beginning. Uh, and we also have the experience and the, and the um, expertise in-house to do uh, the analysis in this way. So in this case, of course, we focused on GEDmatch because that was the database at the time that was sort of most open to do the search. Uh, so, and in GEDmatch, as you know, there are uh, DNA profiles from various different companies with very different uh, marker panels. So we selected 
in this case approximately 1.4 million SNPs in order to overlap all the larger uh, on the panels from the larger companies in order to sort of increase the expected success rate. And here are so some details about the workflow. Uh, this I will say that um, all these details are published in a case report for Forensic Science International Genetics. Uh, so you can read the details for, for the, these different steps uh, that we use. I will not go into that now. Um, in this case, also presented in the case report, here is the result from the GEDmatch search. Um, this unknown individual matched against a number of, of expected third uh, cousins, and then we did some uh, triangulation in order to um, get more information out of this. And as you can see, we sort of got four different clusters representing this unknown individuals uh, or additions of these unknown individuals' uh, grandparents. So, what's about the future? Uh, as I said before, there is no explicit law against this in Sweden. However, we need to sort of uh, establish uh, the current practice to, to be used, which type of cases, uh, which type of data that we should uh, use, and how to handle all the data, not only the DNA data, but all the hit, uh, the hit lists and, and so forth. And of course, then we need to establish the best practice, which DNA, DNA typing method to use. How about the population coverage in the database? Of course, as you know, in the, for example, GEDmatch database, there is heavily, uh, or the largest proportion is Americans or perhaps Northern Europeans. But what about um, other populations? Um, because it's not worth all the money and the work if we do not expect to find any relative from, from, from this uh, possible uh, originating from other populations. And some other aspects um, that I just briefly mentioned here is that, okay, which, the, which is the number of markers that we need in our paper that I referred to uh, earlier, playing in Tilma, for show, show that if you use 20,000 markers with a likelihood approach, we had similar precisions and accuracy as when using 600 markers. And of course, for um, forensic samples, uh, it's, it's, it's much better to use less markers than, than more markers. And uh, yeah, and another thing that we have uh, looked into and uh, we have a user project is partial profiles and imputation because what we've seen is that perhaps we do not get uh, full coverage for the complete genome or for every markers that we would like to need a genotype for. So can we use imputation um, based on the partial profiles that we have? Another thing is the quality assurance. Uh, as a forensic field, we are normally used that our sort of results or evidence is going to the court as so, uh, evidence. But in these cases, the aim is sort of to get the investigative leads and then we do not, I, as my opinion at least, we do not need to have the same um, quality assurance um, as we do in, in sort of in, in a normal evidence uh, uh, work. And another thing that we've learned is that when we work with this, there are a lot of expertise involved, not only forensic geneticists, it's only genealogists and, and the police, and we all need to work together and sort of know what uh, to do. So to sum this up, uh, it has been shown that these methods are very informative, but there are legal, ethical, and technical challenges. And uh, my opinion is that we should make progress, but we should make it with care. And because still this is sort of a law enforcement uh, issue and uh, it comes, certain thing comes with that. And another thing is that uh, many decisions that we have seen needs to, to be handled sort of a case by case basis. It's, it's not that easy to do a overall perfect uh, method because it's so many circumstances within the case that we need to sort of take into account. So I thank uh, you for this presentation and uh, I will be available for questions later on and you have also my email at the end. 
Well, thank you very much, Andreas, for your portion of the presentation. Now I'm passing over the controls to Lori. And Lori, when you're ready, you may begin. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you Thanks. very much. Um, Lori Napolitano with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Before we get started, I should say that I am here on behalf of my employer, FDLE. I don't have any personal financial relationships with any of the vendors. I may mention including Verigen. So I'm going to talk today about genetic genealogy and the tremendous impact it's had on law enforcement in the United States. And these, I'm sorry, hold on. These are pictures of victims of murders and rapes in the United States whose cases have gone cold for years and some even many decades. And unfortunately, during the time we're on this webinar, we know that there will be another murder or rape here in the United States. We don't know who will be the victim and we don't know where it will occur. But what we do know is that it will not be at the hands of these individuals. These are murderers and rapists identified through the use of genetic genealogy by law enforcement. In the last two years since it's been used, there have been over 100 identifications of violent criminals or unidentified human remains using this technique. So it's already pr proven to be very powerful. One of the questions since we started using this is what will happen when these cases go through the criminal justice system? And already the people marked here um, have pled guilty to the crimes and some of them, as you can see, have received sentences and some are still to be determined. And then the next step is, will this hold up in court? What will happen when we go to jury trials? Well, in the United States so far, four of these cases have gone to jury trials and all of the defendants have been found guilty. And I'm not going to talk about these specific cases, but you do have a resources handout where I've included links to some of these cases, as well as a general uh, Wikipedia page that lists many of our cases in the United States, as well as media links and articles. But I do want to point out on the top right, the Jerry Burns case from Iowa, because that is the only case out of these four where the genetic genealogy was discussed in trial. And it happens that his trial is recorded and available on YouTube. So if you're interested in hearing some of the genetic genealogy testimony, then please go to day four and in and out throughout that day, you'll hear the detective, the prosecutor and the defense attorney discuss it. So I think we're off to a good start. We are holding up in court. Genetic genealogy has not been an issue that has presented an obstacle. All the DNA testimony is based on the conviction of using traditional DNA testing by the crime labs. Also, and very importantly, through the work of the Innocence Project, we've had two exonerations. The first last year in the 1996 murder of Angie Dodge, Chris Tapp served over 20 years in prison for her murder. And when genetic genealogy was done, it led to Brian Drips as being the attacker. And he has since been arrested. Chris Tapp was released from prison and he has been fully exonerated now. In the second case just earlier this year, the 1985 murder of Jane Hilton in California, Ricky Davis was still serving his sentence and he has done 14 years. And earlier this year when new evidence was tested and Michael Green was identified as the owner and donor of that evidence, Ricky Davis was exonerated or released from prison. So it has not only identified criminals and made our community safer, but it is also um, freed innocent persons. So briefly, what is genetic genealogy? Genealogy itself is the traditional practice of building family trees back to ancestors using historical documents. Genetic genealogy has come about since the advent of direct to consumer DNA testing, where living individuals get their DNA tested. As Andreas explained, that they're compared to other people who have had their DNA tested and you find DNA relatives. And the way that this works is that you are considered a piece of living history. You're walking around with very small pieces of DNA that you got from your long ago ancestors. In this diagram, this small blue piece of DNA that this person has could be attributed back three generations to his great grandmother. But he's not the only person walking around with that same portion or segment of DNA. That great grandmother had brothers and sisters who've had children 
who had children, who had children. So his distant cousins, second, third, fourth cousins, are also walking around with that same small portion of DNA. They may test in the same database and company that he tests with, and they would see each other as matches or DNA relatives. And the use of this DNA evidence in traditional genealogy helps you confirm the accuracy of your family tree, or unfortunately, in some circumstances, it proves that your family tree may not be accurate. But how does this apply to investigative genetic genealogy or use by law enforcement? And I should mention, I'm only going to talk about identification of a criminal suspect. I'm not going to be talking about identification of human, unidentified human remains. Um, that's not what my experience is in. A lot of what I discuss is similar, but there are some elements of those types of investigations that are different. So talking about a criminal suspect case, I'd like to orient you first to the DNA profile in general, the one that we've used for the last 30 years, which is now STR testing. That's what your accredited forensic crime lab does. That's what goes into CODIS, the arrestee or offender state or national database. It gives you hits to an individual and your case can end when you get a hit, you get that individual's DNA or your suspect's DNA and your crime lab does their STR testing, compares it to the DNA evidence and says it is the same person. Now we have with genetic genealogy, a second type of DNA and that is SNP testing or a SNP DNA profile. It's not currently done in our crime labs. It's something that we will be moving towards. Currently, you have to get it done by a genetic genealogy vendor or a SNP testing laboratory. And I like to think of these as hand and foot. They can both belong to the same person. The STR profile and the SNP profile belong to the same person, but you can't directly compare them and learn anything about the other by looking at one of them. So you have to consider them as two different types of DNA belonging to the same person. But the SNP profile has nothing to do with CODIS. It goes into public genealogy databases, and it doesn't give you an individual. It starts by giving you tips or investigative leads as to relatives. However, the case ends the same way when those leads are investigated by getting a suspect's DNA and not sending it back to the genetic genealogy testing company, but sending it to your accredited forensic crime lab that does their traditional STR testing and compares it to the original crime scene evidence and says this is or isn't the person you've been looking for. Another way to look at it is your cases, for those of you in law enforcement, if it involves DNA, it's gonna start and end the same way as your cases do now. The genetic genealogy doesn't change that. Your crime lab tests your crime scene evidence, develops an STR DNA profile, and it's going to end when you send them a suspect sample and they compare it and get a match to the crime scene DNA profile. What you now do in the middle is the same. You investigate all different types of tips. So this middle part can be a CODIS hit, it could be a phone hotline tip, a fingerprint match, or a video that you review. But these are all ways you currently generate leads about suspects and develop suspects. Once you develop suspects, you know that you often take DNA either surreptitiously without their knowledge or voluntarily to help eliminate them. You send that to your crime lab and most of the time, 99% of the time, they eliminate, eliminate, eliminate people as persons of interest until you finally have your true suspect and then that person is not eliminated and your case is solved. So where does genetic genealogy fit in on this? It's just another lead generator in the middle. It's no different than another other lead generators. What is different is the way you go about investigating that lead. It brings some new elements to law enforcement that we have to look forward to and have some best practices and protocols that I'll be talking about shortly. So investigative genetic genealogy and forensic genetic genealogy are terms that are used interchangeably depending on which you choose to use. Don't think that they're two different things as you're talking about in reference to law enforcement cases. The process is that law enforcement gets the SNP profile developed from their crime scene evidence. It gets uploaded to a public genealogy database and law enforcement has two databases we're allowed to use, GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. Then the matches to the suspect are identified and their family trees are built. And ultimately the person who committed the crime, which is the goal, is to identify that person. The type of genetic genealogy is a very specific application of it. It's called unknown parentage technique, typically used to help the adoptees determine who their biological relatives are. 
And I'm going to show you how this can work in a case. So you always start with your top match, whichever system or both systems that you've uploaded your profile to. You always look at your highest match. As Andreas explained, they share the most DNA with your suspect. And you identify who is that match, and you start building their family tree back in time. And then you start with your next match and your next match. And that's called ascendancy, re ascendancy research. And the goal is you find a group of matches who you can trace back to a common ancestor. And in this example, you have a most recent common ancestor couple. So these three matches all share DNA with each other, but they also share DNA with your suspect profile. And that means you can assume that your suspect is going to descend from this couple as well. Your genetic genealogist who's helping you with this is going to be able to use the amount of DNA information that everybody shares and predict for you where the suspect will fall on which level of this family tree. So in this example, the prediction or the hypothesis is your suspect will be somewhere at the same level as generational level as match one and two. So now your tree has to come forward or down in descendancy research. And what that means is the most recent common couple have other children who have children who eventually and hopefully have your suspect. So you'll find your suspect on the family tree as the descendants of these people. And this gives you, in this example, a large pool of potential suspects. If you're looking for a male, you can eliminate the females that are at this branch of the tree. You can also do what you normally do how you eliminate a pool of suspects. You run record systems. You look at their age. You look at their location at the time of the crime. You look to see if they're in CODIS. You look to see what their criminal history may look like if they have one. And you can eliminate a lot of people off of records like you normally do. But if you don't get your pool narrow enough by records, with a genetic genealogy lead, you can then go towards target testing. And this is the new part of the investigation. So target testing is identifying people whose DNA you could go collect and submit for SNP testing and upload to one of these two pub or both of these genealogy databases. And you essentially generate a new match to your suspect from a known person, you know where they are on the tree. Your genetic genealogist should guide you as to who possible target testers are if it's needed. And there are some challenges presented with that um, that go into some best practices. So that is the element of target testing. Ultimately, those results of those target testers will help your genetic genealogist help you narrow down focus of the tree and have a smaller pool of suspects where you can eventually go get their DNA and have your crime lab tested, ultimately find your suspect. So this process presents challenges for law enforcement agencies, not really more challenges than any other new technique has presented us over the years, just like D DNA as we know it now did 30 years ago. So this type of case can be expensive and time intensive, resource intensive, requires specialized knowledge that not a lot of people have right now. And it is considered more intrusive because the type of DNA profile we're developing does contain more scientific information about the person, more genetic information than the STR profile that we currently use in the crime labs. So FDLE a year and a half ago started a genetic genealogy program. And I'd like to say that we are making Florida safer in 17 months, we've identified seven suspects out of our cases. Uh, those suspects believed to be responsible for eight murders and three rapes, and their crimes occurred from 1981 up until 2016, which is relatively recent. Our program requirements is that the sheriff or police chief and the state attorney of jurisdiction has to formally request to FDLE in writing that we proceed with this type of analysis and they have to commit to investigate and prosecute the case. They have to tell us that all reasonable leads and forensic testing that can be done have already been done and are exhausted, and that CODIS search and a Florida familial search has resulted in no leads. Currently, we, we limit our program to murders and sexual assaults because of our resources. And part of our program, we authorize and test for, um, for all gene genetic genealogy testing and analysis. We pay for all the costs associated with it. And we have a specialized team to work with investigators to bring that case to resolution. 
once you get into the program, we have to look at the technical requirements for your case. So first is, do you even have DNA that's eligible for genetic genealogy testing or SNP testing? And I should say to start and finish, the SNP testing, the technology is changing as we're doing it. It's changed already over the two years we've been using this. But the first consideration is, do you have enough DNA, at least a nanogram, preferably 20 nanograms or more? That number has come down with time, so we are seeing more sensitivity. Um, but you have to have enough DNA to start, then you have to evaluate the quality of your DNA, and that can present challenges. We prefer single source, a mixture can present challenges, but if you have a low level mixture with two people and you have an elimination standard for the person who isn't the suspect, then you may be able to get it done. Degradation of samples due to age or storage can present problems. If you get an incomplete SNP DNA profile, that can affect your genetic genealogy genealogy analysis greatly. Um, but we are seeing enhancements in DNA testing and they are improving with time. So a case that may not have the technical specifications today may be fine for something for tomorrow. Once we then send the sample off to a vendor and we use Parabon Nano Labs in our FDLE program, we send them the sample, they get it tested, they upload it to GEDmatch, we upload it to Family Tree DNA, um, and then often we go, if it has enough matches to be considered solvable or to provide investigative leads through genetic genealogy, we have Parabon do our first round of genetic genealogy analysis and then our team takes over from there if it isn't resolved from their first round. We have one statewide team with the specialties that you see here. Um, we have full-time and part-time assignments. Some of the assignments, like the forensic biologists, those are in our crime lab. They do their regular work most of the time and have some specialized um, roles on our team. I do think a state or regional task force concept works best right now. Individual agencies starting their own teams are not going to have enough volume to see enough variety of cases to really get experienced. Um, we work closely with our local agency uh, investigator. It is not our investigative case. It still belongs to the local Florida agency. We're a support team. Um, all the investigative actions are decided by them with our input. We work very closely, obviously, with, our, with Parabon, our genetic genealogy vendor. On your resource handout, um, there is a reference to the International Society of Genetic Genealogists a wiki page and they have a lot of information about genetic genealogy and law enforcement including a list of vendors. There are more vendors as we go with time um, that do this type of work. And then also I should say Florida agencies are not required to go through FDLE to get genetic genealogy testing done. They can pay on their own and use whatever um, program or company they would like to. I get a lot of questions about the genetic genealogist, and this is a new technique in law enforcement. And just like any new technique, you're going to require specialists who you don't have in-house. So first, let me say there's no certification or accreditation for genetic genealogists, and I emphasize the word genetic. There are certified genealogists, and they may or may not be genetic genealogists, and then there are genetic genealogists that may or may not be a certified genealogists. So certified genealogy is the traditional practice and they have standards um, in place in the work that they do and genetic genealogists on top of that are experienced in using DNA evidence. And so what I would recommend for people looking either to go with a company or if you're considering an independent genetic genealogist, find out what successful experience they've had with either law enforcement cases or unknown parentage like adoption cases. Ask questions like you would during an interview. How many cases are solved? How many hours does it typically take? Talk to customers who've used them. Do you get good, effective investigative action steps? Successful cases are going to require a lot of interplay between the genealogy and the investigative actions. Realize that private companies and private persons don't have access to some of the records that we do in law enforcement. Will they partner with you so that your personnel can run records and save hours and money? Finding a birth certificate can take a minute in a law enforcement system and it can take hours or days um, using public records. Does your company or genealogist understand that you are looking for quick investigative lead information that gets you moving on your case? You don't have to have a family tree that has absolute genealogical authentication. You just don't have time for that. It's going to eat up hours and then money. So you're looking for investigative lead information. 
the type of results you get, and Andreas mentioned this too, gender and biogeographic ancestry, possibly some phenotype predictions as to what the person may look like, the identification of your top matches. Now, as far as the recommendation of who your suspect is, the identity of your suspect, you have to manage your expectations here. You may or may not get a combination of these things listed, and it has nothing to do with the quality of the work being done on your case. It has to do with the quality of your DNA. It has to do with the quality of how many people are in the databases that we're matching to, ethnicity of your suspect, all kinds of different factors. What we all want is the first one, recommendation as to a possible suspect. Here is who we recommend your person is, or these two brothers, or these two cousins. But what you might get is just prediction as to where a suspect might be on a family tree or it's going to need more investigative activity, or you're gonna be asked to do target testing, or it may just need more genetic genealogy analysis time. And I do wanna say the biggest factor about the solvability of a case is the number of matches you have to compare your suspect to in the public genetic genealogy databases. This is a goodwill public effort that people are choosing to opt in for law enforcement matching in GenMatch and Family Tree DNA. We are totally dependent on the public allowing us to do this. And this is different for law enforcement, and this is where we need to be respectful and we need to be aware of how this works and that the public is cooperating and allowing the number of people you can search and match against is critical to your success to the higher match you want to get to how more easily your case is to solve or how hard it is to solve. Realize you may be asked to approach relatives of the suspect and ask them to give you DNA for SNP, SNP testing. That's the target testing. And when you do that, you may or may not know if they're close or distant relatives to the suspect. Your genetic genealogist is going to tell you if they can or can't give you more information about that. And also let your prosecutor guide you. I think this is very important. The prosecutors have to ultimately uphold, test these cases in court and uphold any legal challenges. Your genetic genealogist is going to keep you on the right track and keep you focused in the right area of a family tree. There are some guidelines and best practices really just coming out in the last several months, maybe six months or so. On your resources handout, I have links to these specific guidances, but in general here, they all say about the same thing. Guidelines for the types of cases to consider for genetic genealogy testing, the technical requirements for the samples, the exhaustion of all other resources first, confirmation of the suspect by crime lab STR DNA matching, recommendations to follow law enforcement terms of service for these databases, keeping the identification of the DNA matches and family members and DNA relatives confidential, getting informed consent from persons who are not suspects for SNP testing and their DNA. So when you approach a family member for their DNA, they understand what you're doing with it, why you're doing it, and where it's going. And you will need to seek prosecutor counsel as well. There are times where you may not be able to fully disclose that. You're gonna to have to decide what you tell people when, as well as a decision-making process for when, instead of asking for DNA, you choose to get it surreptitiously. And then all of these guidances include involving your prosecutors throughout, throughout the entire process. So in summary, investigative genetic genealogy has created a new type of tip, but it is highly scientific and it's accurate. There are public privacy concerns, so please seek guidance on responsible and respectful use of this technique. And the majority of the investigation of genetic genealogy leads is really business as usual. What is new, you'll learn as you go. So please don't be intimidated. And in under two years, it has solved over 100 cases that have been unsolved for decades, making our communities safer, taking criminals off the street, freeing innocent people, and most importantly, providing answers to victims and their families. Thank you, here is my contact information. Feel free to email me or through LinkedIn. Thank you very much, Lori, for your portion of the presentation. And now we're going to hand over the final portion of the presentation to Sydney. As Sydney, when you're ready, you may begin. Okay, all right, Sydney Lafarger. Thank you, Dr. Tilmore. Thank you, Chief Napolitano. And thank you, everyone, for your attention for just a few more minutes. Um, 
while we start closing out the webinar. Oops. Verigen, okay. headquartered here in San Diego, is a global company that provides tools to assist with human identification and generation of investigative leads. These tools and services include, for example, kits, DNA sequencers, analysis software, and validation services. For clarity, Verigen does not currently and does not intend to offer ser services for processing evidentiary samples um, within our company. So that role will continue to belong to other types of vendors and possibly crime labs doing the work themselves as time goes on. Um, Verigen are now stewards of GEDmatch. And for me, just quickly to share, as a career forensic scientist, having this role in helping solve cases using a tool like GEDmatch um, is really an amazing development that certainly continues to bring back memories of cases and samples in the past that we all knew um, could be further advanced if we could just wring more information out of the sample. And so now it, it really is a privilege to help um, at Verigen to help in doing so uh, for some of you that are on the webinar now uh, to move your cases forward. GEDmatch allows users to upload single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP calls and compare those data to house data within the database in many different ways. Um, please allow me just quickly to reinforce, as Andreas and Lauren have explained, that those SNP files are not shared directly online in GEDmatch. Uh, those SNP data, a, a base call, if you will, from human DNA are encrypted or tokenized uh, and are not returned directly to users and queries, rather the overall amount of physical DNA that's shared among putative relatives uh, is provided in the form of those centimorphing units. So a little bit more of that in a moment where we'll just look quickly at two GEDmatch tools in a little bit more detail. It certainly also is a privilege to work with the founders and staff who started and built GEDmatch from the very beginning. Um, wonderful people such as Curtis Rogers, John Olson, Drs. John Hayward and Wilbur Davis, who are now part of the Verigen team. Um, so Verigen and GEDmatch seek to continue to honor the genealogy community while balancing the needs of that community with the needs of the forensic genomics world, uh, so to speak. So for me, balance is a key theme as we move forward together. We're balancing the genealogy needs and forensic genomics. We're also balancing consumer privacy and public safety, as Lori went over, and, and, and it, I'm not going to repeat that. I think that was a very strong message that we just heard. Um, we may also agree that forensic genetic genealogy or investigative uh, genetic genealogy will continue to be best conducted as we, when we work together in partnership, crime labs, fee-for-service labs, investigators, prosecutors, uh, defense professional judges, researchers, genetic genealogists. And I just encourage everyone to keep looking for the people who are helping and, and you'll find them. Um, we must support each other regarding the technical guidance and policy best practices as we continue to use these tools and they evolve to identify um, human remains, implicate perpetrators, and even exonerate those who've been falsely accused, as we've already heard a little bit about specifically this morning. So let's move into just a couple of basics about GEDmatch that I wanted to make sure and share with everybody in this webinar. There are four classes of DNA data on GEDmatch these categories are the same as they were prior to Verigen beginning management of GEDmatch. And if I may draw your attention here to the public opt-in and public opt-out, where you see the green text near the bottom of the table, for the public opt-in class, DNA data are available for comparison to any sample in the GEDmatch database using the various tools that are provided online. For the public opt-out class, DNA data are available for comparison to samples 
except data identified as being uploaded for law enforcement purposes. And this, this is per the prerogative of the person or people who own those data. As Lori said, opting in is a public good effort um, that we are continuing to work to increase day by day as the database continues to grow. Secondly, regarding uh, GEDmatch terms of service and privacy, data that are uploaded for law, enf law enforcement purposes must either be from, and I'm just gonna read this, DNA obtained and authorized by law enforcement to identify a perpetrator of a violent crime against another individual, where violent crime means murder, non-negligent manslaughter, aggravated rape, robbery, or aggravated assault, or secondly, be DNA obtained and authorized by law enforcement to identify remains of a deceased individual. So then once your sample is uploaded, what happens on GEDmatch? This report here is referred to as the one-to-many report. There are many ways to view associations in GEDmatch, and maybe the one-to-many report is one of the most commonly used tools where um, result, results are provided as a list of samples that share those physical units of chromosomal homology. Samples are referred to as, as kits. Um, as we see here in column one on the left, if we then look at the first two kits in the first rows of the table, um, these are the unknown samples grandmothers. And when we look at the autosomal DNA column where that second downward pointing arrow is, we see that these two kits and the unknown sample share the most DNA in common across the genome. And then additionally, X chromosomal DNA is provided um, as needed to help in building trees. We have time to look quickly at one more GEDmatch feature here. These are the clustering tools that assist to determine which samples are potentially associated with your kit of interest or your sample of interest that are also associated with each other. Um, you, you just select or enter manually multiple samples, create a cluster table. In this example, maybe we can look at the red highlighted uh, red boxes in the table to see the largest amount of shared DNA that are on the order of what's anticipated for putative siblings. You might remember Dr. Tilmar showed some of the estimations of um, how much DNA sharing is estimated um, among different orders of relatives. So that red there is about, is within the range of anticipated um, siblings. So this type of tool can help you rule in or out relationships, and then can lead you into those types of record searching and other types of investigations that um, both of the prior speakers mentioned. So I'm gonna shift gears now, and um, there's two more slides here. And Marijan wants to share with everyone that we are assisting further beyond the GEDmatch database with abilities to process samples that can benefit from, from forensic or investigative genetic genealogy um, by providing a built for purpose, if you will, solution that generates data on the MySeq FGX DNA sequencer. We anticipate to have for availability to, for evaluation in this calendar year, a targeted forensic SNP kit and forensic universal analysis kinship module that together create GEDmatch compatible files for searching to do, to do the work that um, the prior two speakers spoke about. This fit for purpose design seeks to accommodate aspects such as one, forensic samples that are lower level and partially degraded or damaged, which can be challenging with some of the other techniques that are certainly successful in certain realms, but there are samples that need attention that this solution shown on the slide seek to assist with. Secondly, this design um, seeks to allow for those who wish to bring the testing in-house, and then third, to allow that the data that you generate to be stored in-house, if that's something that um, is a priority for you or your organization. 
this system would also be informative for kinship analysis that don't necessarily need to utilize GEDmatch and for investigations that um, need to interrogate partially degraded DNA samples. Um, lastly, the expectations are also that a similar workflow and software as other products in the forensic line uh, will be what are, are provided. So on the last slide, in so doing, in providing the fit for purpose forensic genetic genealogy solution, Veritrin is providing another fully integrated application as shown here on the left on this slide. Um, the gen genetic genealogy solution joins the forensic DNA signature uh, kit for typing forensic STRs and SNPs, as well as forensic mitochondrial DNA kits and software. These then accompany on the right research enabled applications on the MySeq FGX instrument, such as molecular serology, estimation of advanced visible traits, and donor biological age estimation. Probative data for forensic genetic genealogy begin and end in the criminalistics laboratory, as you heard from Chief Napolitano, with our uh, tried and true short canon repeats as the ultimate confirmation. So with the MySeq FGX, data and allele calls are backward compatible with legacy CE data. This platform can help you to create those forensic genetic genealogy data and then also the confirmatory STR data when your case is aided by forensic genetic genealogy. And you need to um, do that direct comparison to known reference samples. In closing, Veridin and I look forward to updating you throughout the year and to continue working in partnership with forensic professionals all around the world to improve the tools that we, we need for forensic analyses, including genetic genealogy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I truly appreciate that. Um, we are coming to, actually, we've our time is almost up, or actually our time is up, but we do have time for just one question. So um, this question here is for Andreas. Andreas, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And so the question I have for you is, on the slide that you showed earlier in your presentation, which relatives can be expected to be found? What does graph label surname infer inference refer to? Well, I think that was just as a reference and uh, the probability of uh, finding a sort of relative based only on, on surname. So I think that was one. Uh, 0 0.1. Um, the probability of finding someone is around 10% uh, mm -hmm. only on the surname. That's a reference. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we truly appreciate you sharing your time with us, but unfortunately, we don't have any more time for any questions uh, for the Q&A session. So um, I thank you all for participating with us, but if you do have any okay. questions, or concerns, you can uh, send a follow-up email to Andreas, Lori, or Sydney, and there you see on your screen is their email address. Thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is greatly appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share this link with your colleagues who are not able to attend today's webinar. They can do that when they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Andreas, Lori, and Sydney, for their insightful presentation. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next.